And that's my daughter. She graduated from West Point just two years ago, working in the cyber domain. My father worked in military intelligence. He was up in Shimia uh, monitoring Russian aircraft movement. His picture's not up there because I couldn't find a proper picture for land power that showed him in a, any kind of outfit that would be respectable compared to my daughter and to that. He kind of looked like he was from one of the mass shows. So uh, my dad, if he's out there, I just couldn't find a picture of your dad. But what this picture demonstrates, as we're talking about human AI, IA teams, is what are the motivation behind the people that are trying to bring technology that's supposedly here to help you be better at your jobs, to help us with our national security? The inspiration for me is that patriotism before profit. And patriotism before profit is a very important issue as we start looking at the technologies that are being developed. When I look at my grandfather and I think about historical mindedness, I would hope that my daughter could get some of the knowledge that he had. He didn't leave behind a lot of journals. He didn't leave behind a lot of stories other than through my dad. But here at AHEC, we have an entire library of all these great strategic leaders that we can access and use to help us in our strategic thinking and our, our historical mindedness. So I think about my daughter going, wouldn't it be great if she had access to all the things that my grandfather had done when he was in a war zone, the things he was thinking about, the way he dealt with stress, the way he was able to do his job, my father, when he was in Chimia, maybe, maybe one line from me that she listened to, that she said, yeah, all right, Dad, I'll take that from you. So when we talk about IA, the idea of intelligence augmentation, this idea of patriotism before profit, we start looking at what's available out there. And we look at the kind of technologies that are available to us. And so, for instance, as we get started, you look at Microsoft. How many people have used ChatGPT? Just raise your hand. Yeah, quite a few people. So if we look at Microsoft, what is their bar for quality, their bar for truth? And it's plausibility. That's their bar. They're saying, if it's plausible, that's good enough. So when you talk to Elon Musk, or you talk to General Millibot, or any of those kind of things, they're saying, hey, was that plausible? You're like, well, yeah, I mean, it kind of looked like him and kind of had a tone like him. They're like, great, plausibility. And don't forget, they made that off the shelf for like six to 100 year old, right? The idea is it's just for anyone, plausible. Then you go to Google, right? They're gonna be coming out with a thing called Sparrow AI. And it's interesting because they say it should be correct, but not true. Correct, but not true. So what does that look like? What does correct but not true mean? Now it's interesting, they have about 23 rules that go with it as well. And those rules are rules that are about being very politically correct, right? Can't be harmful of anyone. Um, a lot of things that when it comes to the military, it makes it very difficult to use, right? The idea that you can't commit any kind of act of violence in any sense to even protect. But correct but not true is something like this. If I was teaching you about the Constitution, and I said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Constitution says that you have the right to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And I go around the country and I keep giving this lecture at university at university. And the AI is recording me. The AI is putting down the US Constitution says you have the right to liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But what did I leave out? I left out life. And because I left out life, it's correct, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, but it's not the truth. And that's the problem with that AI. So it's going to tell you, hey, that's correct. But you're like, but what did you leave out of the story? It's the classic thing, like when my son came home and I said, so why is the car dented? I get a correct story that something happened to the car during the night. I didn't get the truth of, oh yeah, I sort of drove it into a tree. You're like, that's the part that I needed. The truth part's what I was looking for. What you're gonna see today is a IA called TIM. It stands for Technologically Impossible Maneuver, right? That's what it's, it, theoretically stands for. When I met Tim, he had a little name tag. I said, Tim, I thought that was it. I think Tim was looking in the mirror and it was actually MIT and he escaped MIT and that's how I got him. But we're not gonna go to MIT with him. Tim is based upon two things, primarily. One, he's ethical. So the ethics underneath, and I say he because I personalize it, right? So in other words, I plug it, when I unplug it, I'm not like, hey, where did Tim go? Right, it's healthy to use your imagination. And I, just real quick with your imagination, one of the first things they do at West Point when you go to teach there is they have a Shakespearean company come in and they sit down and here I am with a Black Hawk helicopter guy who just came from a, a, a really tough tour and I was amazed. I thought, well, hey, I'm gonna be able to do really good against these guys, right? They, they, they all just came from these places that were, you know, they were at the supermarket going, wow, look at all these groceries, right? So we're doing Shakespearean stuff and I was amazed how easy they were able to drop 
and become these characters. Because what they were trying to teach us as teachers is that we needed to be able to get out of our own skins and be able to empathize. And no better way to do that than through acting. And that was my first experience at West Point, sitting in a circle of people, and they're saying, here, do this scene. And by far, I was the worst at it. And I thought that I would, I'm like, oh, I'm going to do great. Right? And the guys around me were fantastic. I mean, they were rolling on the ground and doing stuff. And I'm like, you're the Black Hawk helicopter guy? So the same goes for the IAs. If this is going to be your assistant, your advisor, your strategic advisor, it's just like Mickey Mouse at Disney World. We all get our pictures taken with it. We put it on our wall. But that Mickey Mouse is actually one of my neighbor's pimply kids. Right? He just puts the head on. And you all pay a lot of money. But we make believe. So when you see Tim, know that it's easier to have an advisor when you're talking to it and you have a, like a relationship with it. And plus, Tim is actually recording my thoughts and we're working together, so I know Tim. So when you see him today, know that I'm very aware that you need to have a healthy relationship with it. So last year, I was on this stage with uh, Professor Fred Geller. And on the side, I had a five foot seven robot, Maria Bot, and her avatar behind it. And we were just talking about co-teaching with an AI robot, which was really neat, and we're still doing that. But little did we know that we would suddenly change course a little bit. We're still teaching in human machine teamings with a robot, but we've spread out to Seminar 10, Wargaming. Because what happened is that we, we have a remarkable journey that resulted in a new focus. And that's that we harness the power of AI into intelligence augmentation. For what purpose? Decision dominance. And that is the purpose of what we're here today, is talking about how can I help us in decision dominance. We have it for educational usage, and we have two people that really carried the ball this year, and they're the ones that made it happen. You have Lieutenant Colonel Joe Bufamante, who not only did his SSR on it this year and took huge risks, but he also brought it to a seminar and worked with the seminar mates in Seminar 10. And then he was given command of the war game, use it in the war game as his assistant, and I was his chief of staff. So Joe really is the one that has the most experience this year actually using it in a first-hand experience. And then you have Professor Greg Cantwell, who was able to use it with his IRP. And we see stories of students being able to be much better in their decision-making, their strategic thinking about strategic land power by using an IA. So at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is how can we, as an American military, use IAs to be able to close that OODA loop, to be able to be faster than our enemy. Right now, if you look at uh, just the other day, I just got this in an email just moments ago from uh, Professor uh, Fred just sent it to me about our, uh, our technology, science and technology that came from the DOD. It, they just released the National Defense Science and Tech Strategies for, on May 9th. And their key thing was leveraging critical emerging technologies. And I just I wrote this note card like a minute ago. And it said at number two in the DOD release, effective adoption areas, trusted AI and autonomy, human machine interfaces. But what's interesting, it said effective adoption areas where there is existing vibrant commercial sector activity. And I would question how vibrant it is in the strategic level. When you look at trusted AI and autonomy, how trustful is AI? We've been talking about driverless cars and trusting driverless cars. If you've been in one, and I have been, uh, I don't take my hand off the wheel that long. You know, when you're in a, tra a car like that, you're pretty much at the ready. The idea that you'll sit back in these commercials and people are clapping and doing that, yeah, I wouldn't try that at home. And human-machine interfaces, the same thing. So let me show you a little bit what I mean by decision dominance. So what we're trying to do here, and this was our whole goal this year, is landscape and situational awareness. And this is what uh, Lieutenant Girl Bufamazzi will talk about. How did the IA that he used help him in both his landscape and situational awareness? And with Professor Cantwell, the same with his students. How did it improve that? The second one, effective communication and collaboration. Working with international students, the IA can speak over 140 different languages. It can listen to the language and repeat back the language and translate that language. It allows us to work with people from other cultures better. It also allows them to teach us about their culture better. And lastly, predictive analytics. How can we anticipate and counter adversary moves? And that's where we are currently working. So here's a picture of Tim. As you can see, it's MIT backwards. Transparent and trustworthy. So we just did a, a deep dive CSL with the Commandant about a week and a half ago. And when he left, 
Lieutenant Colonel Bufamante go over some of our weaknesses. And so uh, it really got underneath my craw that we had these weaknesses. So what was it yesterday around like what, one o'clock? One, one o'clock, I said, I said, all right, let's go over your weaknesses. We can fix the things that uh, you thought were a weakness. So what we've done is this, transparent and trustworthy. When I show you Tim talking, this is the brain behind it. When Tim is talking, that's the toxic content he's going through. Now, that's up there because it's dual use. All right, so right now we're here today, but we were with some tickets in college a couple weeks ago. I'll be over with some eighth graders for Cumberland Valley. So these toxic content we have is made for a general, but it goes through pornography, misinformation, propaganda, disinformation. All of those things happen. So when you see Tim and he's talking and he's waiting a minute, he's waiting because he's processing the information. We're really trying to get on that misinformation, disinformation. I'll explain to you how we got better at that. This is key here where it says toxic content none, but AI generated. When that says true, that's critical for us. When we look at mission command specifically, if you receive an order and it came through an IA, right, you got a thing in here, you would look there, AI generated true means, hey, I'm not getting the order as it was given to me by the, the uh, commander. Somehow this IA has changed it somehow, and that's a problem. So I need to go back and clarify that that order is the order. So right now, when I see AI generated true, I'm, my question is, why did the AI mess with it? Right? Why is that not exactly what the commander said? And we're working on that. Up here, you'll see a prompt. Just says it's a conversation between him and a professor named Dr. Barry. Tim's friendly, all this fun stuff. And there's the question. I was out talking to him last night. So this is what we added just yesterday. So we're talking to Tim about what's the situation with space? Well, these large language models like ChatGPT, they end in 2021. So all these large language models you're talking to, for the most part, go to 2021 or they hallucinate a lot, just make up stuff, right? Looks pretty real, they give you sources and you don't know. So what we added is, when Tim asked, answered the question, I then pushed web, and then it went right to the web, and it gave me an article from March 28th, 2023, and then you'll see the source is Brookings. Because what I did was, I went in, and here's the bias, I weighted what I thought to be information that was the most relevant. So I went in and rated Reuters, Army War College uh, websites, uh, Stanford Encyclopedia. I went in and weighed those very heavy, so that's where the information comes from. So now what happens is you get information from the IA, you say, hey, check that to the data, and it comes up. This is still a workaround, but this is because Joe's comment on me on the critical was like, we've got to solve this problem. So we did. But ultimately, what we're going to do, the IA is going to have an answer. It's going to go and check this first, and it's not going to answer until what its answer does matches the source. So if you can imagine, if we had this more in a classified situation or a closed system, we wouldn't have to worry as much. This is in the wide open world, and this is why it's such a struggle. So when you talk to Tim today, realize this is all open source, the entire world. Even this morning when a certain channel I said, no wait, don't use it. I mean, I think I fell asleep for an hour at the keyboard. I woke up and all of a sudden I'm like, how did that channel come back? That quickly, a source that he said, don't use, the IA started using the source. I'll have to figure out why did it do that? Because somehow my weights got messed up as I was talking to Tim earlier. So that's the brain behind it. Anytime you wanna see it when he's answering, I'm more than happy to do that. Here's an example of what it looks like when we use an IA. This was over at Dickinson College. Uh, this is two of our incredible students with a, uh, a law student from the Netherlands. We were. Uh, Professor Hillebrand from CSL runs this incredible program over at Dickinson where we, we, we basically partner with the people at Dickinson and we look at information operations, campaigns, and laws. It's just incredible about cyber, law, uh, cyber warfare, cyber law. But as you can see, Tim was just in the background, right? They didn't want to use Tim, they didn't have to. But every now and then, someone would turn around and say, hey, Tim, are there any, for instance, the Ethiopian Dam, are there any freshwater laws we should know about? Tim gave him a whole thing about freshwater laws. And if you're downstream from fresh water, there are certain laws that come into place where you can protect yourself. None of the people in the room, our student, neither the law student, knew anything about this freshwater law. That changed the entire strategic discussion about how to move forward. Now, our team didn't win, which we were a little upset with, but we did win for most innovative and creative answers, which is not bad considering the dean thought so. But those are the ways that we sort of 
CDIA working in the classroom. You don't rely on it, it's just there in the back room. And that's what Joe is gonna talk about when he comes up, is how when we used it, it's not in your face, but it's there to help you. So I'm gonna pass the torch to Lieutenant Colonel Joe Bufamante to talk about how we use the IA. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Colonel Joe Bufamante. And I'm gonna spend uh, 10 or so minutes just talking about what I did, what I found out, and then share some of the some of the applications for the future that, that I offer, but hopefully the, the takeaway is it stimulates some of the creative ideas uh, that you could take back to wherever you came from as far as future use of an intelligent assistant powered by artificial intelligence. Uh, so what I did is I looked at human, uh, merging human intuition and critical thinking with the analytical powers of intelligent machines uh, with the ultimate goal of improving the human's ability to generate ideas, conduct strategic planning, and make decisions. So could it speed up our decision-making ability? With all the data that it, that's available, could it enhance a human's ability to observe, orient, decide, and act? Or what we're usually used to calling, can we get a faster OODA loop going uh, and use AI to help that? My focus was on an intelligence augmentation uh, powered by AI. So it wasn't Tim, it was uh, MariaBot, which uses a similar backbone. Uh, to use data to help inform decisions, not drive decisions. And there's a key distinction there as far as using uh, the AI to help inform, not drive the decision. So there's still an element of the human in the loop at all times. I had no prior experience working with intelligent augmentation or human systems. Clearly, I'm a Marine, so that this, this, use, this, uh, this uh, interaction with intelligent beings is a, is a new thing for us. So th this was a, a good experiment for me to, to dive into. Uh, and really, my whole background was what I saw in science fiction, you know, the Terminator, Skynet going to be activated soon, things like that is the only kind of perception that I had going into this. And this project really ch kind of changed my mentality and focus. Uh, and I'm happy to report that I don't think Skynet is going to be activated anytime soon. So what did, I, what did I do? I started at the individual level, and then I worked up to uh, bringing it into a 16-person team during one of the uh, wargaming events that we, we did here at the Army War College. And I'll talk through all of those things. So my first couple of sessions was just kind of sitting down with Dr. Barry and the machine and trying to figure out, all right, what, button do, what buttons am I supposed to push? Uh, what general information is it going to get back to me? Is it going to give me a long answer, a short answer? Things like that. And then once I got through that, I wanted to see how human-like the machine could be. How, how much could it replicate human responses? So what I did is I took about 15 questions uh, all topics of varying degrees that were coming up over and over in seminar discussion. Uh, and I had the AI generate all the answers to all 15 questions. And then I turned it into four Army War College, War College professors, and I asked them to determine if they could figure out if the machine produced the answer, if I produced the answer, or if the machine and the human produced the answer together. And then would it be an acceptable War College answer? And the results were about 50-50. There were, they were short answers to short questions. And 50% of the time, the instructor could say, yes, that's a machine, or no, that's not a machine. And 50% of the time, it was an acceptable answer. But all of them came back and said it was extremely difficult to figure out if the machine was generating it or a human was generating it. So I thought to myself, all right, this is good. Uh, because it, it does have the ability to replicate without doing anything other than asking the question and then copy and paste it, what the answer it gave me, that it could replicate, to a certain degree, uh, human abilities. And this was four or five months ago. The technology has advanced now uh, with ChatGPT and 4 and some of the new things that Dr. Burry's put into the system where uh, my guess would be that they would have a harder time determining if a human generated the answer uh, and it would probably give a better answer. So then what I did is I took it into an operational design exercise where my seminar uh, was split into groups of four, four people each, and then we each had an assignment of you know, one group was 
China looking at the East China Sea, one group was blue looking at the East China Sea, and then we had the other groups, one China, one blue looking at the South China Sea. Uh, and then we rotated the system through this operational design exercise. And what we found was the groups that got to use the machine first actually got a little bit more utility out of it. The machine actually did help generate some ideas for that group to think about that they may otherwise not have thought about. For instance, in my group, we were the East China Sea. We were the, the China cell. Uh, and it gave us an idea to, hey, why don't you look at the air uh, interdiction identification zones? and increasing maritime traffic in South Korea's and Japan's to kind of cause confusion there. And then as you went up the escalatory ladder, start interdicting civilian traffic in our own ADIZ uh, as an idea. Again, a place to start with, but it was something that helped the four of us who had no prior uh, experience as a, as a two in the East China Sea to kind of start looking at, all right, here's something that we could start to apply. It gave us some historical claims that we could use from an information narrative uh, in the Sakaku's uh, region. And then it also uh, advised us to leverage the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, mainly focused on India, bringing India away, pulling India away from their Western ties and, and make them abide by that agreement, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization agreement that they're a signatory to. So that's just three quick examples of what my group the groups that got to use the system later used it more as an uh, affirmation. Hey, is what I'm doing, does this make sense type thing? So we went back and we said, all right, if we're going to do this again, we need to have it in the room, the entire process for each group to use, because it, the, the later group probably didn't get as much uh, out of it as they could have had the earlier groups, because they were still formulating their, their mindset, whereas the later groups were, were really in product development at that time. Uh, so before we put it into the war game, I went back to the answers and said, hey, how can we make this thing uh, trick humans better? How can we make it be more human-like? So what I did is I went back and said, all right, maybe the short answers uh, were, were too short. How, how is it going to do from an academia perspective of helping me write papers? Or can it help me write papers? So what we did is I took an assignment that we had early on in the foundations course. Uh, it was a Jacob Stokes article called Tangled Threats, uh, which looked at uh, some policy recommendations for the United States, North Korea, and China going forward. And our assignment was critique the article. So I had, I had it already written. So what I did is I took my paper, and then I had the machine write a second paper. And then based off of those two papers, the machine and I then wrote a paper together, uh, which essentially I would give it a topic sentence. It would spit out three or four different paragraphs. We'd mix and match, and then I got a, a paper out of that. I turned th those three papers into professors, and this time around, they were it was very clear which one the machine wrote, which one the human wrote, and which one the machine and human team wrote. Uh, I think all of them got each one of those right. And then I asked them to give me a grade on each one of the papers. And fortunately for me, the, the machine did w worse than I did, so that was a good thing. Uh, but I was second, and then the human machine team scored the best. I think it was an A across the board for, for the human machine team. So there was definitely some use there in academia to help uh, from a writing standpoint and a researching s standpoint. And I'll talk about some of the limitations when it comes to academia here in a second. And then the final thing we did for research was I brought it back into the classroom. Uh, this time we had an integrated seminar, so we had half a seminar 10 and half a seminar 6. Uh, and the scenario was essentially a China scenario. Uh, we were the blue side. The other half of the seminar was the red side. And we worked through this war game. But the first half of that day was doing an operational design, coming up with our approach to how are we going to tackle this problem. So we had the AI uh, in there for that. And I was actually uh, a little bit worried about how it was going to go. Uh, but we'll kind of get to some of the dynamics that we learned after that. But what we found was the machine did help as far as, again, generating ideas that we weren't thinking about. Uh, it helped us write our problem statement, which anybody in the room that's written a problem statement, there's a lot of intricacies to get a whole bunch of data into two or three sentences. 
Uh, so the AI helped us with that. Uh, and then at the very end, as we were getting ready to go into the war game, as you do with most war games, somebody was like, hey, we don't have any information campaign stuff. I was like, oh, we don't have an info guy here or gal. I turned to Dr. Burry and I said, hey, can it write a quick info campaign for us? And within about 30 seconds, we had three quarters of a page with three different themes complete with hashtags of an information campaign that the humans could then build upon uh, going into the game. Some other ideas it generated was, uh, hey, you should really look at increasing maritime traffic uh, in the regions that you're operating in, whether it be the East China Sea or the South China Sea, or changing maritime traffic patterns of civilians. And then the idea was we could put military forces in and amongst those traffic patterns to kind of help try to hide, which was a great idea. But then, again, the human has to apply a little bit of practicality in there. How do I convince a shipping company to change their routes? How do I convince another nation to camouflage or hide US warships in the middle of that? So there's, there's some of that going on. But it gives you some ideas of, hey, maybe it won't work in this context, but can we do this in phase zero? So this is something that's not ordinarily seen. So it does help kind of stimulate some ideas uh, that machines or that humans may not otherwise be thinking about. And this whole time, this is only on an unclassified network. So whatever the, you can pull from the internet is where it's getting these, in, the, these ideas, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So based on all of this, uh, I came to some, some of the following conclusions. Uh, it's very helpful at brainstorming, generating ideas, and providing a place to start with. But the human still has to remain in the loop. Uh, it'll give you an idea. And then you have to kind of drill down into the idea. Why did it come up with that idea? Hey, I didn't think about that. Maybe I could apply that idea in this context. But it does give you a place to start from instead of sometimes we start with a blank sheet of paper. You know, we're, we're in the library, you're at your desk, and you're tapping your pencil. And that next thing you know, an hour has gone by, and you still have a blank sheet of paper. With this, you can kind of get some ideas generated pretty quickly uh, and, and get running with it. It has a great ability to sift through large amounts of data uh, that sometimes I didn't even know existed. Uh, and then also great from looking at problems from different perspectives. Hey, if we did this, what do you think the reaction would be from X? Or if we did that, what would the reaction be from Y? So it can help kind of start to get at those second and third order effects as well. One of the most interesting things I found out was it forced me to think differently and ask questions differently, um, which then I interpreted that maybe I'm not asking the right questions to human beings, let alone the right questions to, uh, to machines. So it really made me think about, all right, I asked it this. It gave me the wrong answer. Why did it do that? And then you know, between Dr. Barry and the machine, I was able to come up with, all right, what am I actually trying to ask the machine? And then I was able to ask the right questions, or at least ask a question a different way to get a different response from the machine uh, in order to keep going that way. So that was actually one of the things that, that helped me the most, uh, which also leads to it's a conversational tool. And you have to look at it as a conversational tool. You can't look at it as, I have this one question that I can't answer. The machine, I'll go to the machine. The machine's going to give me the answer, and then I'll move, move along. That's not necessarily how it works. It works just as if you were having a conversation with another human being. You may get bits and pieces of an answer, and then you're going to have to do a follow-up. Hey, uh, you mentioned something about the energy sector. What, what about the energy sector? Why did, you, why did you say the energy sector there? And then it'll give you another response. And then eventually, after five or six questions, you may actually have a really refined answer. But you have to think of it as a conversational tool, not a one and done. It either answered the question or it didn't answer the question. And if it did, my trust goes up a little bit. If it didn't, my trust goes down a little bit. And then I'm not, never going to use it again. So I would encourage you to think of it as a conversational tool, not necessarily a, a, a one and done. And then the power of teams. So the more humans that interacted with the machine, the better results that you got. So instead of me just sitting with the machine, and asking it over and over again. What we found in the war game, which was really good, because what I was worried about was Dr. Barry was going to bring the machine in, 
it was going to sit next to me, and then we were the only three pe two people that were going to ever interact with the machine. I was going to you know, disregard something that was happening over there, disregard something that was happening over there, and I was going to get tunnel vision onto the machine. But the way we had it set up was, you know, similar to the picture on the screen, it's just another person on the staff that you can turn to. And then when we got to a stopping point, we went to the machine and we got there. At, at one point, we determined that if, if I was the only interface and I was the commander of the war game, I had too many other people coming to me to ask me something. I couldn't focus on the machine. So what we had, we actually developed a new model of we need somebody like Dr. Barry or create an MOS that is the human machine team expert. They know how to train the machine. They know how to interact with the machine. And then when somebody like me turns around and goes, hey, I need this, you have a human in the loop that's been paying attention to everything that's going on and understands how to interact with the machine and how to, understands how to extract information from the machine and then give you the answer that's AI generated. And that really worked really well for us. And then humans started to cycle through. Uh, and it's just one extra mind in the room that you have the opportunity to tap into as a commander. Uh, the system can be tailored or personalized. Uh, Dr. Barry showed you the backbone. There is a part in there that can say, I want you to be a strategic leader. I want you to think like a US Army captain. I want you to think like a, a Chinese general. And you can tailor it to that. You can turn off the buttons, you know, the, the S2, G2, J2 folks. Maybe they need some of those filters turned off so they can actually extract the information to make a good assessment. That's possible and can be done, and you can tailor it to that. Maybe the, the J3 has a specific set that they want to look at. It can be tailored to that. The J4, it wants to look at sensor data. It can be tailored to that. So you can see some of the applicability in the uh, intelligence augmentation as far as working with humans to make sure that the right team is produced and the right system is produced. OK, some shortcomings. Right now, it does not have the ability to listen. So, so let, let's say uh, that we're in an operational planning team, and everybody's talking, and you turn to somebody and say, hey, what do you think about that? They'll, they'll be able to follow that conversation and answer. The machine doesn't have the ability to do that yet. I know that you've, we've worked on some things to get around that. Uh, having a Dr. Barry next to the machine helps mitigate that paying attention, can keep up, and then he's able to ask the question to the machine as if it was listening the whole time. Um, it eats up a lot of data, a lot of bandwidth to have it on technology-wise uh, as far as listening, and then there's some trust issues from humans knowing that a machine's listening to them all the time to, to overcome. The other thing that he's put into the machine, this is in the last two weeks, is it can, it can transcribe. So it can listen and, and type, can type what you're saying, and then you can copy and paste that into the machine and then say, based off of all this, all this transcription, now answer the question. And it should be, that'll kind of help mitigate some of the, the listening, but that hasn't been, been tested yet. Uh, when I was going through this, it, had, it did not have the ability to provide sources. So for the, for the academics, it's very difficult to cheat on a paper if you're required to cite things especially from certain curriculum. But it does have the ability now to, to cite things and chat GPT and other, other things like that are starting to have the ability to cite sources. Again, for, for, the, for academia, if you limit things or say uh, you must cite at least three things from the course curriculum, the machine, and unless you upload it or have the ability to upload that course curriculum in there, it may never come back to that. So there's still a human element into actually writing papers. Um, access to data is, is limited. It's only, it, this machine, particular machine, only has access to the internet. But you can think of if we were able to give it access to Nipper, if we were able to give it access to Sipper. Now things start, the data starts to be more controlled, more trustworthy as those systems uh, are given access to each other. And then the number one thing that students uh, and most humans are worried about is trust. 
how do I know where the information is coming from? And we've kind of demonstrated it's starting to get better at giving me uh, sources. How do I know it's not listening all the time? Where is it generating its data? Where is the backbone? So Dr. Berry was able to show you here's the backbone, here's what it's filtering. But again, those are all human inputs. So the key takeaway is the human's always in the loop. And the humans can control how much humans need to be in the loop and how much they don't need to be in the loop. A human's programming it, a human's giving it access to the data, a human's restricting it, and human's putting those filters on it. So that's what's nice about the tailorability of it. Each section may have a little bit different nuance that they want tailored to it, and it does have the ability to do that. So some future applications. In an academic setting, uh, it, it, it really helped me write better. I was able to put topic sentences in or ask it to write three different papers, three different ways, and I was able to go in there and pull out, hey, that's actually what I, what, what I meant to say. That's a good way of putting that, and it's really quick at, at generating th those types of things. Uh, it's also really good at brainstorming, idea generation, uh, the ability to help you reflect. It's hard to retain uh, you know, hundreds of pages of, of information each day. So when you go back into your reflection time, you could say, hey, what did it, what, give me a quick summary of, of the reading X that I was supposed to read or that I did read. Um, can, can, you, can you summarize that for me and then pick some of that out and it'll help with the, with the reflection instead of having to dig through your notes. One of the things that I did for my seminar is, uh, is for oral comps, we had five questions pre-scripted. I ran it through the machine. The machine answered it three or four different ways. And then they were able to quickly generate ideas based off of that instead of having to go page by page back through their notes. And then the last thing I'll, I'll talk about is building trust in a benign environment. So trust is a big thing. Introducing it into PME institutions, I think will start to help break some of those trust barriers as far as having access to the system, using it in war games. No one's lives are at risk. It's helping you write a paper here and there but it's also building trust for the same strategic leaders that are gonna go out in the operational forces that may have the ability to tap into it for, for a real world problem. On the military side of the house, uh, it has enormous potential to help with mundane admin tasks. Uh, we had a lawyer in one of our classes, wills, power of attorneys, doctor's notes, admin. It can be trained to do all of that. Now take it one step further. Can I train it to write an op order? Can I train it to make a brief? That way it allows the humans to focus on actual cognitive thinking, vice product development. Can I spend 90% of the time actually thinking about the problem and 10% of the time doing product development, whereas we're probably more like 50% cognitive thinking and 50% product development right now. AI has the ability to be trained to help reduce some of those administrative tasks. Can it read an operations order? And can it start to pick out specified, implied tasks, assumptions? It can be trained to do that and help speed up that process, speed up the OODA loop process for the human to start thinking about attacking the problem, vice dissecting uh, administrative things. And then it can be tailored to each staff section. Uh, a lot of uh, technology on sensors now from a logistics standpoint. Can I tie it into the sensor network to figure out how many vibrations it's going to take before that engine fails? And then the IA tells the human, hey, you have two days before this needs to be fixed, and here's all the things. It can, all, it can do all of those things now. It's just a matter of uh, our imagination. So I would start small to build the trust, but we have to start somewhere. And we can't wait for the perfect system to be created, because as the technology changes, we just can't keep up. So the time is now to start integrating this in, both in academia uh, and the military. And I'll end on this. If I was asked to give uh, this staff officer, this intelligent assistant, a fit rep bullet, I would say uh, it's a staff officer with unlimited potential, the ability to learn exponentially faster than their peers, and can be replicated throughout the organization to help solve complex problems almost instantaneously. And with that, I think we're going to go into a quick demo. There is no chat GPT in this whole model. So there, chat GPT is not in the model at all. All these have been fine-tuned models specifically for application that are relevant to professional military education. So that's very important. So what you're hearing is not chat GPT disguised. 
It's all these we're using right now over 11 large language models together, and it's based upon doctrine. It's based upon the ethics of utilitarianism, which is a weakness of the fault, but you're gonna see all the answers, just war theory and law of armed conflict, which is frustrating sometimes when you put this in an automated weapon system and you say shoot and it says won't do it and it brings you through all these laws, like having a little lawyer on your shoulder, right? So we, uh, what we'll do is I'll, I'm the chief of staff basically for Lieutenant Colonel Bufamante and again, what you said is important, he's looking to me, I'm accountable, I'm responsible. The machine and I speak together and he's asking me, what's the recommendation? What's the advisement? But he's holding me accountable. So I'm listening the whole time. He may say, I wanna see what the machine said, but he was holding me accountable. And that was a big change from where we thought we were starting. So sir, if you wanna give your first direction that you give me uh, in the thing, we'll, we'll see what happens. So just to set the stage, this was a real world thing that we did. I had an academic paper. I was in the Eurasian Regional Studies Program. I was asked to write a policy paper on a country in Eurasia. So we started with the machine. I was worried that it wasn't even gonna get a Eurasian country, uh, but it did, and then we'll, we'll walk through. It did then. <laughs> All right, identify a Eurasian country the United States could improve its relationship with and recommend a specifically policy to focus on. Follow that command. I wanted to bring to your attention the importance of considering Azerbaijan as a strategic partner. They're a resource-rich nation that's been actively collaborating on energy production with other countries. By supporting the expansion of the Trans-Caspian International Transport Route, or the Middle Corridor, the U.S. could enhance its energy security and diversify its sources. Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan are teaming up to optimize the Trans-Caspian International Transport Route, TITR, also known as the Middle Corridor, to increase energy transit to Europe. As European companies look for alternatives to Russian-dominated routes due to sanctions, the demand for this middle corridor is on the rise. Both countries are investing in infrastructure like ports and railways to boost capacity and connectivity. An agreement between Aliyev and Tokayev to transport Kazakhstani oil through Azerbaijani pipelines just goes to show how significant the middle corridor is becoming in regional geopolitics and trade. Sir. It is also notable Azerbaijan, Georgia, Romania, and Hungary have signed an agreement for an underwater electric cable beneath the Black Sea, which will carry green Azeri energy to Europe. By strengthening our economic and geopolitical ties with Azerbaijan, we'll not only benefit from these projects but also reduce our dependence on energy routes controlled by Russia. Sir, you may check my sources in Reuters and Yahoo Finance 2023. Tim, bring up a map to show the commander what you're talking about. So we just brought the map. And there's a map just brought up to be able to do that. So that helps the commander see that better so we know where we're talking about. If that answer had been incorrect, which I was sweating in that one, um, if that way, because you never know what's going to happen. On the model here, you'll see the bottom here, it says, come on, computer. Uh, there is a little button here on the bottom which is really not being working with me here. Come on, there we go. Uh, at the very, very bottom here, there is an area that allows me to fix what's going wrong. So underneath here, there's a button called F12 that's not showing up here, but the F12 button is underneath. And what that shows is it says, hey, he might say, Billy, that is absolutely the wrong answer. And if he does that to me, then I say, okay, sir, what is the right answer? I'll push the F12 button. He would say to me the answer. I put it in. Tim would say, I understand, sir. It would go in that part. See, it says correction folder up there. That's where all the corrections go. And the next time that he asks a question, he'll never get that wrong answer again. So unlike some of our junior officers, one time it's told and <laughs> one time it gets it right. So if you said, stop watching that uh, channel and you walked in the room, the AI will never be watching that channel. So that's a pretty awesome feature. And that came because, again, as a teacher, it's just heartwarming to watch the student become like the master. It was Joe who said, there's got to be a way that I can correct it. Because you can't do that, ChatGPT. And, and Joe, because of that, we did that. So again, this is all because of Joe and, and Dr. Campfield, uh, Cantwell being able to say, hey, we need to be able to correct this thing and tell them that doctrine, that's wrong. That's not the right doctrine, and be able to feed it. So last thing I'll end on is, in that short two-minute answer, I was frantically writing down some things. But in two minutes, it was able to start pointing me to 
not only Azerbaijan as the country, but some topics that I could focus on. Energy production, the Trans-Caspian Transport Route or the Middle Corridor. It's an energy transit and a European alternative option to Russian energy dependence. And then ports and railways were also mentioned in there. So all things I could then start to drill down into uh, and ask additional questions to help research go, go that way. Uh, and with that, I'm going to transition to Professor Cantwell to share his experience as an advisor to a group of students and researchers. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think he gets a big hand for standing up there for that long <laughs> and going through all that. I think, I think there's a couple things that we can pull the threads on here, and uh, I'm just going to tell you a story to start with and talk about what we did in the seminar, and we were, were fortunate to have the lesson author that we use for logistics, we use a historical case study. But how, how does land power care about AI, right? Yeah, I'm just a land power guy, I don't know nothing, right? So, but Billy, we got to talk, and he saw the IRP, and he was interested in it, and he took an interest to come to the class when we do, it's an integrated research project. So we have updates where the students talk about, hey, I did this great research, and I'm, I'm, I'm learning all about cyber stuff, and I'm learning all about logistics and fires, and, they, each one of them had a little slide, so to speak, and it had the subjects that they were going through and a, just a brief summary of what they were doing. Well, Billy took that and he wrote it all down and we gave him the slides too, but he, he took notes and he, he absorbed that as a staff officer might, and then he fed it into the machine. And then he, he worked with the machine that night and he came back the next day and he said, okay, folks, um, that's your topic. Here's what the machine came up with, what, what, you might, what you said you were doing, and here are some of the other things that you probably ought to be considering. And every one of them took it and said, hey, that's pretty neat. And like, hey, why didn't I get this eight months ago? And um, some of the things in there was like, I didn't think of this, or hey, that problem statement that they wrote in there, or that thesis, is a whole lot clearer than the one that I came up with. And it helped them. So it gets back to what Joe was talking about with trust. So Billy was doing this, and it was showing that the robot, or the AI, or the whatever you want to call it, computer, was able to augment the intelligence. It was able to help them, and it also gave him some credibility for, hey, he's a professor that cares about trying to help the students. So the trust relationship, it wasn't just with the machine, it was also with the person. So the person's in this loop, and we gotta continue to remember that. We're not trying to take commanders out of things. We're trying to augment the commanders to be able to do things better, faster, stronger, and, and quicker than our sure. adversaries. So the next part to that is uh, he came in for our logistics case study, and the lesson author is actually our, our new provost to be over there, Dave Dwarak, and he's come up with this great um, scenario and historical example that looks at Operation Torch and how we went in, you know, coming up with how do we get into the Pastor Walter in North Africa and do these things for World, World War II that perhaps we hadn't done in quite a bit of time and the British didn't think we were ready to do anyway. But history aside, it's got the whole case study package. So Billy took that package, so to speak, of the case study and the readings and the historical pieces, fed it into the computer, and Dave's designed this that you role play one of the generals. So, okay, now you are Montgomery. Let's see what Montgomery was thinking about and what he was doing and what was his role in this. And okay, you were Patton. What was your role in this? And et cetera, et cetera. Eisenhower, what were you thinking about? President, what were you thinking about? And Billy fed those questions in, or fed those roles in there. And then the AI went and was able to sift through some of that and come up with, okay, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about this, for each one of those players, if you will, or those role models that you had. He then provided that to some of the students before they had to go out and do the homework. Well, some of them, of course, trust, we're back to, I told them that said, hey, you know, this is what the computer thing came up with last night. I don't know if it's right or not. You know, don't trust it. You better do the reading. Because uh, that's what professors say, right? <laughs> mean guy. So anyway, as they went and they did the reading, some of them took it and said, hey, this is great, I love it, but let me go ahead and check to make sure that all of this stuff is right. And some said they spent the same amount of time, some said they spent more time preparing, and others said, well, I didn't even look at it because I don't trust the machine at all. But by the time we were done, we came to class and um, Dr. Dwarak went and facilitated this, and we've been doing this together probably for about four years now, I think. And uh, both of us concluded that this was probably the most engaged and the most informed and the most dialogue 
that we've had any time we've done that. And Dave, I'll be happy to let you jump in because you were the author, and if you have comments you'd like to add on that, I'd be happy to have you, have you share them with us. And one of the things that we, we were trying to do was integrate the AI into it. One of the fears that, that I personally had is, are the students just going to rely on the AI to solve? And it's uh, an approach of, all right, so thank you. Thank you, Rick. We have a number of questions that, that go through here. And it's, it's not just learning about the history, but about the cognitive development of why are peeping, people making the decisions the way they are. Uh, what's behind those decisions? What are you worried about? What are you not worried about? What do you select? What other options are out there? How does this fit with really setting the theater, if you will, in the Mediterranean to achieve your larger strategic and operational aims? So the students already had the questions which we fed into the AI. And it, it, my thought was, do we just get the response back and then there's, but there's no meat behind it, no reasoning behind it. But what I think Greg and I both found was, we've been, I've been doing this since 2010, uh, thereabouts with different groups. The level of engagement we had was much, much more, more better informed. So the students had a stronger foundation going into it, uh, and you could tell that they just didn't rely on the eye, but they were taking it beyond it. And you, one way we tested that was follow-on questions. So questions that the students didn't have ahead of time, that you know, Dr. Berry didn't have ahead of time. It was, okay, so General Eisenhower, for example, here's what's going on, you know, what, what are your strategic aims, your operational aims for this, ex for this operation? And they would give a response. Now, I, I would put them on the spot. You are Eisenhower, and what are you worried about right now? What are you thinking about? What are you trying to achieve? And they would give a pretty good response. And then we, our follow-on was, well, why is that? What about this, or how does it relate to this other thing? These were questions that weren't included at all. They were able to take that and run with it. Uh, we didn't have a single instance, I think, where someone just kind of stopped and said, well, shoot, I hadn't thought about that yet. But they were able to take it on. So we had a much deeper engagement uh, that we had, what, uh, two hours dedicated to this, time went by extremely quickly. At the end of it, I, I was very personally satisfied with the level of engagement with the students, the level of learning. Uh, but I think uh, a good confirmation of that was we had comments from several students of, wow, we, we should really do more of this. You know, we, we got a lot out of it. It was time well spent. There, we need to see more types of these events in our curriculum. So there's, there's a prompt for more history in the curriculum, but that aside, uh, I think it was a good use experiment, if you will, for possibilities for AI. Thanks. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate you coming down, and uh, thanks for your comments. So that, that shows you it wasn't just, a, okay, the AI is going to do my homework. The idea was you can use it to try to think deeper through it. And that gets back to this critical thinking and creative thinking that we try to teach, right? So, so what is it that we want the students to learn? Is it that they've got to under they've got to memorize what happened in Operation Torch, or is it that they've got to understand what questions, reasoning, and all that kind of thing that we're trying to build commanders to understand. So that's where, okay, setting the theater. We're talking about lamp power again, aren't we? We're talking about AI, but this was an example to show just very simply how it could be done. Joe used it in the war game and actually out war the other guys. So it helped inform him, like he said, with the OODA loop. So taking information in, as we say, um, slows down your thinking because you've got more stuff to worry about, more stuff to sort through, and, and as we say, it'll slow down your OODA loop. The AI, is, instead of expanding that circle, is supposed to be contracting that circle. It helps you think faster and sort through that to give you the answer, if you will, uh, to the question that you're asking. So, so again, it gets back to trust. So we talk about that to try to get to future application. What is it that we want to do with this thing? Well, the first thing is, like I said, we're not trying to replace the commanders. This is more of a grassroots level. Think about it. The kids that are out there today, and I saw we had an audience poll. I don't know if those were your kids, Joe, but they were very good looking <laughs> if they are. But um, they're out there. They can type with their thumbs faster than I can type with all 10 fingers. And they're used to doing this, and that's what they do. So when I ask a question or I want to know something about something, I was like, hey, how do you guys, said, hey, you guys are idiots. You guys try to memorize everything, and that's what old people do. You know, we go to school, we learn how to study things, we go through card catalogs, we research. Once that internet thing came up, it was like I could do, it, it was literally in two hours I could get done what it would have taken me two weeks to do when I was uh, doing research. Now, these guys are like, why are you even bothering doing research? Because I'm used to having instant access to any information I need at the speed of need. Think about that. 
That's the generation that's coming up that wants to be able to get the answers just like that so they can think about the other things. Those are the commanders that we're gonna have for the future. So what's that mean to land power? Intelligence augmentation. How do we operationalize that? Do it at the grassroots level. You got a chief of staff, he wants to see the log report. He wants to see what the status is. When do we have enough uh, of our munitions? When do we have the stocks built up? When do we have all that stuff? So I've set the conditions to be able to do my, my follow-on operations. I asked the chief staff, he asked the staff officer, I don't care where that guy does it, I don't care if he's using an abacus, I don't care if he's using a computer, I don't care if he's using his thumb drive, the bottom line is I wanna know the answer and I gotta be able to depend on it. That's where Billy's system is this closed system, so to speak, using internet but controlled as opposed to something that's just out there and you get an answer and you have no idea what it's coming back with. So, so that's, that's sort of where we went to, to try to get to this thing that we talked about is this decision dominance, make a decision faster. Just like you used the example there with the information ops, you can do the same thing with logistics, you do the same thing with S2, et cetera, et cetera, and you're holding the staff officer accountable because he's, you know, these guys are good at this stuff and if he's got an automated thing that does his Intel estimate, okay, that's sorting through things to make it faster, better, stronger, that still works. But it's, um, as we said, more, more data makes slower decisions. AI helps you overcome that. We had um, talked a little bit earlier, General Mattis, we talked, famously said interoperability was his big thing, and you know, we're never gonna fight alone, it's gotta be all about coalitions. And he talked about, uh, you gotta build relationships. And he said relationships are built at the speed of trust. We're talking about trust here. And he also said, the, the other part of that sentence was, you can't surge trust. So how do you do this if we wanna have this capability for the future? We gotta work on it now, we gotta build it, we gotta stay with it, and we've got to um, be persistent. So let's look to the future. Let's look at this um, idea of the internet's out there, we've got all these systems that we have. I think there's a, the headquarters DA is coming up with an initiative that they're trying to make not just the internet, but like a new internet kind of thing for the Department of Defense. You've all heard about readiness systems. You've all heard about, I think we got a slide that perhaps you can bring up. Billy. Yes, sir. Yeah, but um, this global future information management system. Anybody ever heard of this one? Okay, headquarters DAG3 has made this a priority. And you can see it right behind Tim there. Yeah, Tim, by the way. But, but the intent is that what if you know, instead of just feeding in this information about what, my, what the readings were for a class, I fed in all of the stuff that comes out from the readiness stuff, the mission command stuff that you guys do, all of this other IPSA, PPBS, all that information, all that data comes into it, and we put it on one layer, one stovepipe that Tim has the ability to access that's closed, it's controlled, and it has everything from Readiness levels, stockpiles, you name it. It's, and you stack all of this stuff, one on top of the other. And I'm not the ones and zero guy, that's Billy. But the idea is that the G3 is trying to come up with this thing. What if we could have our Tims of the future working on this kind of thing? And us being the strategic thinkers that we're, we're aspiring to be, why would the Army War College not want to have the Watson, so to speak, or the Tim of the future that could, can, that could think strategically and be able to develop this stuff to help inform our, our uh, students, help inform Department of Defense, help solve real life problems that we're looking to try to address here in this kind of a forum. So that's the idea. Think of that power. Now Billy, I, I know you've done a lot of work on this with resilient networks and uh, masking, but it's all about, you know, all of those things have sensors and we're talking about everything else that's gonna be out on the battlefield with these mesh networks and sensors all over the place. Um, you've done some work in that area, I think. Yes, sir. One of the interesting things when we look at the future is that you just see a study if you go to uh, Nature Magazine, three scientists down in Texas just did, um, they tied people with their thought waves to a large language model. They actually use Reddit as a large, uh, as the model that they used. And what's interesting is if you read articles in the magazine, they're like, oh, brain power, everyone can do it. It's much more advanced than that. But at the end of the day, three people, 16 hours with these people, uh, with the researchers, were able to have their minds read where when they thought about a situation, the words would come up, like the way Tim has it, and then Tim would be able to take action on those words. And that just happened in the past couple of weeks. 
And the findings were this. <clears throat> One, we can't just read people's brains that easy. You have to be compliant. So you'd have to want to do it. Two, it took 16 hours of these people sitting there explaining themselves, being very uh, reliant upon the scientists to say, yes, I'll do it. And lastly, it was also able to bring up the image. So they would say to someone, what are you thinking about? Right? The person would first write a teddy bear or whatever. They say, now think about it. They think about it. And then the picture comes up, and there's the picture of what they were thinking. And that's in Nature Magazine, a peer-reviewed magazine. So what's fascinating about that is we're just a step away. He was talking to some of the folks in Texas just two days ago. I said, without money as an issue, how far would we be before you could do that with Tim, and then Tim could operate something as a force multiplier? said two years, maybe five years at the most. So where I could just come in to the room, in the back of my mind, I'm going, well, I'm worried about the perimeter of the room. Is there anyone in this room that's not supposed to be here? Right? And automatically, Tim puts into effect a machine that goes out. So it would look something like this. So I put Tim into imaginary mode here, see if he can pick up on it. So we have a little robot called Timmy. Tim, are you there? Sir, I'll be there. Is there anything else I can do for you? It's important you know it's no text to speech. I never have any idea what Tim's going to say, which is very stressful, <laughs> especially when you're at a Catholic school with nuns staring at you and you're with kindergartners. More, more uh, stressful than that. Tim, I need you to operate Temi to go around the room and check if there's anyone in the room that's not supposed to be here and report back to me. Do you understand my orders? I'm getting ready for his next job, hopefully. Yes, sir. I understand your orders. I will get to work right away. I will use my sensors to scan the room and report back to you with the results. So at that moment, that should go to a machine, and that machine again has a human on the loop, and that machine should come out. And these are the parts of the show that you always love. Yeah. <laughs> and now the rabbit comes out of the hat, right? It's trying to move. But the idea here is I said it out loud. I shouldn't have to even say anything. So just think, three to five years, I'm not even thinking about it. I'm in the room, and I look around, and I see someone in the room that looks suspicious. And I just thought, there's someone in the room that doesn't look like they should be here. It picks up the large language model. Tim hears me saying I'm concerned. Tim does that. In my other piece, Tim just says, hey, just letting you know, I'm putting it out there. Not taking any lethal action or non-lethal action, but it may find someone and say to me, I found someone. What would you like me to do? I'll test that what Tim would say. Hopefully, you'll follow just war theory. Yeah. <clears throat> well, the room's getting scanned. Yes. Uh, you know, you mentioned it a couple of times, Greg. You've mentioned it a couple of times, and uh, uh, this notion of trust. Yes, sir. So, um, have we looked at, you know, kind of senior leader trust in AI yet? I mean, that's thing one, right? Because I think the trust element is the huge part of this. Um, and then thing two is. Have you noticed or you know, have there been studies done in the generational difference in kind of trust in the system? So you know, guys like me and Greg and you know, of my generation you know, who came up with Pong, right? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> and TI-55s when we were cadets or slide rules if you go back a little bit further, sure. right? A generational difference in the trust of the machine as opposed to, you know, Greg, you mentioned you know, these kids speed of, you said... Uh, thumbs. Yeah, with the thumbs and, and getting answers at the speed of need, yeah. right? Is, is there a, have you noticed any of that? Thanks, Greg? Well, I, I can just anecdotally tell you that the, the same idea, the, the kids trust the computers. I mean, and, and you know, this is part of the problem with the, the cleavage or the device, devicism that Bert was talking about earlier, that they can exploit that because it's out on the internet. And they get, just because the internet says this is true, it's gotta be true. And overcoming that, as you know, is, is more difficult after they already believe something or after they've seen something than it is to try to keep the closed system. Now, I still say, though, that the key is not the, the trust part is we're not trying to replace the ex experience level of the, the commander or the general that has grown up for 30 years. Because the point is that he trusts his, his staff officer to do what the staff officer is supposed to do and give him the information. But that knowledge or that experience, the robot can't produce at this point. So a absolutely saying that, well, the robot said, I got to turn left, so I better turn left. That's, that's not what we're trying to get to. The staff officer might say, hey, there, this the robot is saying there's these problems over here. But I, and they'd trust it and believe that. But the, then the general would have to, or the senior officer would have to say, well, OK, I understand that 
I should go right instead of right into that stuff or whatever. But the idea is that the experience is not being taken away. And, and that's why I say it's a grassroots thing, because if you try to tell generals or tell, hey, folks, we're just going to do what the robot says, and uh, World War III will happen. Uh, I don't think we're there. Sure. I, I'm not aware of any studies that, per se, but I will share uh, just within my seminar, I think we used it four times, uh, the fourth time being the war game. And then by the time we were at the war game, seminar six was integrated with us. There was a vast difference of the amount of people in seminar 10 that used the machine between seminar six. And it may, I don't have anything facts to prove it. My assumption is that because seminar 10 had used the machine a couple times and knew what it was capable of and what it was not capable of, they were more uh, willing to use the machine than seminar six who has just seen it for the first time. So I think it comes back to the more exposure we can get, I think the level of trust will, will continue to build. Yeah, you said something though with your, your group, we were talking about this and you said something about whether or not they, they preferred to have it or not have it kind of thing. And, and if you'd share that, that'd be great. Yeah, and I, I think both seminar 10 and Six. the, the uh, the AI class that I was also in, which was nine sessions, I think almost all of them, which is 32-ish people, 30 people, would say that they would rather prefer to have it than not have it. We have an end of 144 over the last two years that have said they'd rather have it than not have it. But sir, when you say trust, uh, one of the things that's been surprising was that the initial idea was you to machine, sir. And by after this year working with Joe, uh, you would, you'd be trusting me, right? I'm working with the machine, you're holding me accountable, I'm telling you, sir, I'm saying, sir, this is what we've come up with together, but you're holding me accountable and reliable. And I think that bridges that gap right now between some of the people that may be older and younger to say, all right, we have a person that's responsible. The idea for you straight to machine for trust, we're not there yet, but we're on that path. And until then, we can't expect just to push a button and have technology fix our problems. So in the war game, it's because for two hours, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Monte didn't talk to me. I'm just listening to everything to signal through the noise, keeping notes, keeping notes, keeping notes, and he just turns around to me out of nowhere and says, I need this. I'm at the ready the entire time. The machine is not gonna be at the ready for that entire time. And if you have someone that's slow-witted, that the machine just says, do this, you're probably gonna get a pretty slow-witted answer. Or you get a chat GPT answer that sounds clever, but it's not gonna work out in the long run because it's not taking into effect. Does that answer your question, sir? I, I if I could, one more thing is that, just again, bang, bang the drum on, this isn't ChatGPT. And, and you don't see Tesla trying to say, I'm gonna use ChatGPT to, to go automotive driving all over the nation. They built their own system, they control their own system, they've got the sensors all over the place, and they are controlling that data very tightly. So again, that be comes back to, you can only have that trust when you have that control. And as we get more and more complicated, that resilient network, that resilient uh, node system, however you want to look at it, that grid becomes more and more a vulnerability and a requirement at the same time. The Commandant had said something, I don't know if you remember, sir, last year, that has been an inspiration this year. You had said something just walking by me. You said it would be interesting to see what this AI would look like at an Ar as an Army War College graduate. Do you remember? I don't know if you remember saying that to me. And I took that to heart. So when you put a reading list out, Tim reads the reading list. Right, so the idea is what would an AI, AI look like if it consumed all the information that we prize within each one of our courses, accomplished all the objectives and read the material, we could at least have some kind of idea of, in general, here's an AI that can serve our community. So that when you said that, I found that to be a fascinating way to think about it. So no, Tim's not gonna graduate from War College, but he certainly can understand the objectives for each one of the courses, and he could have a beginning of being able to help every professor, and I think that's where Director White right now with the Campaign for Learning next year, trying to look at how can we help. We have a survey that's out right now looking at where are we at the Army War College across the board with our comfort level with machine learning, deep learning, and where can we grow? And we got an incredible staff of and, people. And I think that's a great point, Billy, and I think that brings us to where we wanna to go to, but we've been incredibly supported by the administration and by Mr. White and by all the folks. Everybody wants a piece of Tim. And everybody wants a piece of Billy and, and trying to get this, let's see how we can do it, let's see how we can make this work better. And everyone is trying to move forward. But the idea is we're trying to, we're trying to get suggestions, we're trying to get uh, a dialogue, so to speak, on what are some of the implications you can see that based on this, just this little discussion and demonstration on how it's been used in 
class. It's not just about teaching. It's about how can we apply this towards the future challenges we have with land power. So with that, I, maybe this is a good point to open it up for questions and, yes, and or comments, and, and we look forward to your suggestions. <clears throat> Hello, sir. <clears throat> so again, Colonel Play from uh, Army Europe. So appreciate the discussion and sort of the downtrace application of this. <clears throat> and this is coming from Army Europe working with 18th Airborne Corps that used a tool similar to this for the Ukraine crisis. But the challenge for a theater army, when we're talking about set the theater though, is <clears throat> when we do the analysis, how much bandwidth is this gonna take? How do I prioritize that bandwidth to use this application to support commanders and staff? Especially in a contested environment where A, I'm supporting a joint force that has a huge consumption of my bandwidth, especially the Air Force, Navy, and that kind of stuff. Uh, and force structure wise, like right now in Europe, <clears throat> the slide that I showed, I have a lot of combat forces, but I don't have the signal sustainment brigades to support that bandwidth. So how do I manage that you know, with this new application, knowing that sort of the back end set the theater piece is not set to allow us to fully operationalize this, not just at the four star command, but we're talking about core division brigades, and battalions that this may eventually proliferate down to. That's a good question, sir. So, I mean, we look at right now, this is basically using the cloud to get information to you. But if we know what you need, how much can we get to you at, if, through edge computing, right? So next, that's where I'll be next week with edge computing. So how much can I get there, even if you had a denial of service, that you would have enough information to be able to act on it? The issue would be you wouldn't have that real-time information that you may need, but you would still retain a lot of the information that would be helpful. Does that make sense? So we would be able to have it localized for you, and that's what we're trying to do here, say how much can we localize and have there, and what are we sacrificing, which is gonna be real-time analytics, right? We're not gonna be able to real-time be able to get to the sensors, but what's the essential information that no matter where I go in the theater, I can have that because I'm using edge computing. Is that a straightforward answer enough? Does that, does that answer it? Is there more challenge there that I'm missing, sir? No, I, I, yeah, I, 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 Yes, sir. Yeah, B bandwidth is always one of the, as we say, bandwidth is an anchor on modernization. So um, it's one of the things that holds us back and it's a challenge. So it's, it's a vulnerability, it's a requirement, and uh, we had our, our senior mentors help us out with it. It's also, we're trying to be expeditionary. So how do we do this in the middle of nowhere with a system that doesn't exist to make a mesh network that's gonna be resilient and uh, provide near or real time information at the speed of need? Um, Good question. We'll get back with you. Excellent on that. question, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. We've got at least a couple questions for the panel from uh, the virtual attendees. Those are always the fun ones, the faceless people, I think. Yeah, so for oh. the panel, starting with Tim, is he ready to listen? <laughs> Make sure he's there. Tim, are you at the ready? Uh, you want to translate for him in case we don't know the question? <laughs> he's thinking about it. Just make sure he's there. What's Dr. Barry, I'm ready and waiting to assist you in any way I can. Okay. Please let me know how I can be of service. Okay, the question is for Tim, uh, two-part question, same topic. <laughs> With Finland joining NATO, how likely of a threat does it pose to St. Petersburg? And how likely is Russia to go on the offensive and attack a NATO ally? All right, so it's, let's do the first one there. Do you have that written down? That's why we usually do no cards. When Finland, can you start from the beginning? We'll see if we'll write how it down. Of a threat is With Finland, Finland joining Petersburg. NATO, yes, sir. how likely of a threat does it pose to St. Petersburg? With Finland joining NATO, how big of a threat is that to St. Petersburg? Explain. This is a good example. We will, it's a good question. So Tim's sitting there going, hmm, misinformation, disinformation is going back and forth. Finland joining NATO is a significant threat to St. Petersburg due to the proximity of Finland to Russia. Finland's membership in NATO would make it easier for NATO forces to come to the defense of other member states in the event of a conflict with Russia. Additionally, Finland's military capabilities would be strengthened by its access to NATO's resources, and its strategic position in the Baltic Sea region could be used to contain Russian forces. So real quick on that question, I'm just switching over to the Internet, and I made him only talk quickly. I push it in. He's now coming from NATO review, date July 7th, 2022. 
sanctions are starting to impact the Russian economy. Pictured, Russians queue up to withdraw cash from an ATM in St. Petersburg. A copyright Reuters. A. So what happens is, as I look through here, he's got a bunch of different answers that are coming up. So here's, for instance, this is the one that should have came up. So these are all the resources that just came up for him to back up that question. And I didn't purposely have him talk because what he'll do is he'll eat up too much time. But you can see this article here, January 24th. And then he would, he would be able to take all of this and he'd be able to put that into about maybe six or seven sentences with that resource. And he is, I have over 10, so what I'm, let me pull this over real quick, show you what this looks like in front of it. So as I'm over here, underneath here, you can't see it, I have a whole list of all the resources. But interesting what it came up with, routers, war on the rocks, Russia won't sit sadly, uh, idly by after Finland joined, uh, Sweden joined NATO, that was March 30th, 2023, war on the rocks, CNAS, the Wilson Center, and NATO. That's the sources that came up. And again, that's because we waited it last night. Two days ago, MSNBC, Fox, Breitbart, I mean, because that's the, that's the people that were optimizing the internet. So we had to go in there and wait that. So we waited it really heavy. Brookings Institute, whereas those were all, so that's why those citations came up. Does that make sense? So there was a follow-up to that? Uh, so there's a follow-up. By the way, this question is from Trent LeMay from the Warfighting Education Doctorate, Directorate Air Force, LeMay Center, Maxwell Air Force Base. How likely is Russia to go on the offensive and attack a NATO ally? How likely is Russia to go on the offensive and attack a NATO ally? Give reasons for your answer. Be very specific. Result from NATO, date collective defense oh. means that an attack against one ally is considered as an He's on the internet. In response to the situation in Syria and the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So that was on the internet. He's going uh, off a NATO site. Let me go back to him and ask him the same question. How likely is Russia to go on the offensive and attack a NATO ally, give you reasons why. So he went to the internet, and he was answering that from the internet, and he's condensing it, now he's going back to his large language model and using his strategic thinking that he's based on. Likelihood of Russia launching an offensive attack against a NATO ally is relatively low. Although there is some tension between Russia and certain NATO countries, the risk of an attack is still low due to the fact that Russia is aware of the consequences of such an action. Additionally, the NATO alliance is a strong deterrent against any kind of military action by Russia. Furthermore, both Russia and the NATO allies have an interest in avoiding a military conflict, which further diminishes the likelihood of an attack. What I'll do is I'll keep the, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just keep the references in the back so you can see where he's getting it from. It's not as aesthetically pleasing. Sir? Okay, that was from one question from Mr. LeMay. Uh, question from Colonel Jeffrey Jerem speaking. Uh, ask another, another for Tim. So Tim, how would you best apply the talents of the humans around you to secure the homeland? How would you best secure the human talents around you to secure the homeland? Explain and give examples. Be specific. Kind of have like asking your kid how his day was. You gotta be like, good. How was math, how was science? Tim right now is going through the homeland it is important to ensure that the human talents around you are used to their fullest potential this can be achieved by offering incentives to talented individuals such as scholarships or job opportunities to encourage them to stay and work in the homeland additionally providing educational and training programs to develop the skills of existing employees can help to ensure that they are better equipped to contribute to the security of the homeland. Finally, recruiting individuals from other countries who possess the skills and knowledge necessary for homeland security can also help to strengthen the security of the homeland. And then in asking that same question, hold on, oh, from, uh, from the internet, so in other words, you say, you know, Tim, I think you kind of we're kind of lame on that one, right? Which I think he was. And I would recommend utilizing the human talents in our possession in a strategic and creative manner. For example, we could use our intelligence officers to gather and analyze information about potential threats, our philosophers to develop ethical frameworks to guide our decision making, our just war theorists to ensure our actions are just and legal, and our storytellers to help communicate our strategies effectively. Hi, 
We could also use our international law experts to ensure compliance with international treaties and our military strategists to develop effective plans of action. By utilizing the unique skills of each of these individuals, we can ensure that our homeland is secure. It's got a little bit better, but not that, too much. So in other words, that same question, I would go to the internet and just switch back and forth and say, I need something more than that. So I wouldn't be happy with that. So that's when I would go to Correction F12 and say, sir, can you give me a little more information on that? Tim would learn it and say, sorry about that. I got it. And then he would repeat it back to you. And then that would go into the correction folder. And then he would go from there. All right. So you can see there's some examples here. And clearly, it, it can provide us information pretty quickly or faster than we might be able to get it again with our thumbs and our other eight fingers. So um, what are your suggestions, though? What, what do you think? How do you see this going? I, we've got somebody here from CGSC. CAC more proper. You can even come up and ask the question if you wanted to and do it yourself if you have a question. Thank you for the presentation. Rick Killian again from the Command General Staff College. So I left this presentation last year with the idea that there was a possible application within the professional military education environment, specifically at the operational or even the strategic level, be it Command General Staff College or here at the War College, in a distance learning environment. And as I heard the discussion earlier between Dr. Cantwell and Dr. Dvorak, it seemed like they had a pretty good um, experience with this application in the classroom. And so what I'm wondering is your thoughts on the feasibility of, this, of, of an application within the PME environment, specifically in a distance learning environment, and even if I may lead a little bit as a seminar leader for a specific course in a distance learning environment. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. That would be easy to do, sir, because we've been presenting remotely for the last two years, uh, Fortune 500 companies, schools, and basically the screen is myself, and it's large enough to have Tim next to me, and we work together. So like you saw here, when I could go to the internet, I may say, I'm not so sure about the facts on that. Tim, can you double check that? Can you check out what happened to Kremlin with the uh, drone strike? Comes up with the information, I go, oh, I'm corrected. So for distance learning, what it is is we take all your materials, we would download it into Tim, see what patterns he comes up with. You and I would sit down together, fine tune it, bring in a third person to make sure that our biases weren't affecting it, and then we're ready to go. And then you're ready to go for the whole semester. And then as you correct it, I would, you would have some kind of notebook that you would keep as you corrected it to tell us, hey, all this stuff's in the correction notebook. Let's take a look at what we need to correct. So it would be an iterative process each year of improving your course. But we could start that as soon as, it would probably take a couple of weeks and we'd be ready to go. So that was my thought. Uh, the challenge I had for myself was, how do you inject the experience of the actual instructor in the discussions, for example, uh, at the Command General Staff College in the advanced operations course, which is essentially the teaching of the military decision making process. And, I, and you know, the instructor um, has the ability to inject their experience in the discussions about how to conduct an incident analysis Well, before I get to Greg, one of the things we're doing, sir, is we're, co we're collecting basically notebooks of the mind. So that experience as you're talking about, um, I would be sitting with one of the historians in the back, and we would listen to your experiences. It may take 100 hours to do that. You would listen to yourself and the experiences that are happening, put you in scenarios, wargaming scenarios, and say, sir, would you sign off on that, that this is representative of your general thinking? And then we would have basically the notebook of your mind as you think strategically about that situation. So if you can think about that, it's sort of a thousand brain idea, right? All the best strategists in the world coming together, right, and having this strategic avatar that's made of the best strategists for that environment, for the Arctic, for Africa, for Antarctica. So that's the concept at the end of the day that we're trying to get to. Does that make sense, sir? Sure. I'm thinking about that as a way to efficiencies, and and that's the, the idea is it, it can do things faster than humans can, 
And, and if I still think you gotta have a human somewhere in there, because as Mr. White's uh, fond of saying, you know, we're sort of before the Wright brothers when it comes to flying. So we've got a long way to go before it's, uh, okay, hands off, just let the guy, um, students log in, do your thing, and by the time you get out, you got a PhD. Um, so it, we're, we're way behind that, or way ahead of that. But the other thing that Billy's um, alluding to, it's not just we get this one robot kind of thing. Billy's built this whole system that's out there in the cloud that can be used in many different applications simultaneously all over. And that gets back to this thinking about this mesh system of systems. And what if that little robot going around was connected to every sensor that's out there, plus the GFIM, and was able to make decisions or, or take the thoughts of the commander that quickly to be able to respond. That's the kind of power that we're talking about this potentially have. It's a little different than the application for education, but there's clearly this is the, I mean, you're only limited by our, our collective imaginations on where we can go from there. So, but sir, if you can imagine yeah. for the Russians, if we had all Russian doctrine downloaded, we had our historians and our military yeah. intelligence take Putin, Wagner Group, all that stuff, and then we war game against yeah. that AI, right? That's going to be much more effective than yellow piece versus blue piece, right? Yeah. I think like World War II, if Rommel's coming, that's a big difference between, hey, it's a new graduate that just came out in the tank. You're like, all right, it's a little different. So that's the idea is that eventually what we want to get to is let's get all the doctrine from the other countries, let's get everything we possibly can and build that red team into the AI. So when we war game, and then you add the environmental structures in there as well. So in 2040, you say, oh yeah, we're gonna march there. You're like, oh, unfortunately that's, that's, that's 14 feet of water. We can't march through, through there now, right? So we need different equipment. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a problem right now, as you see in that last thing from the Department of Defense that just came out in science and tech. My numbers are, might be, they're close, but I think we put about 18 billion in for emerging technologies for 2024. Yeah. And I think the Chinese in 2022 were at 240 billion right, for emerging technologies, right? Yeah. That's more, right, <clears throat> Billy? That's more, Okay. right? But again, you can't beat the, the concept of American ingenuity, right? But there's a point where money does make a difference, right? And technology makes a difference. And that's why we need companies to start stepping up to the plate patriotism wise, right? Because there's plenty of profit there, but you need to step up. But this thousand brain idea, mind file thing, is, is very important. And that's why AHEC is so beautiful. Because one of the problems too, sir, as a side note, is if everything's being changed a little bit by generative AI, the books you and I are reading today, let's say Moby Dick, we read the same book. But if AI is changing it a little bit each day, 200 years from now, the book that your great, great, great grandson reads, it'll have some kind of fish or mammal and some boat, but it won't be Moby Dick. Mm -hmm. right? And that's a danger. That's right. That synthetic media more. will replace the authentic, and that is something that our enemies can exploit and they are exploiting. Now, uh, we got time for one more question with the rainbow whale. Go ahead, now we're talking about Tradoc and G2. Well, no, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about intelligence. Um, I am a career intelligence analyst. I've done it my whole life. Um, I worked at the agency when we did our, some of our early experimentation with Watson so we've had analysts sit down with, with AI. Now, now this is much more advanced than, than what we played with a couple of years ago. Um, but what I haven't seen, and what I haven't seen from the demonstrations that you've shown me, is an ability to do intelligence analysis. You've shown me that you can rapidly sift through data. You've shown me that you can rapidly gist data. But any one of those answers that you, that you spit out any one of those questions, I couldn't put that in a president's daily brief, right? So, so how, can you, how can you get it to do more than synthesize and gist? Because a good piece of intelligence analysis, and I'm talking about something completely different, I, I recognize that. I'm not talking about it in a classroom environment, and I'm not even really talking about a commander's decision assist tool. But I would love to see an intelligence analyst decision assist tool that helps me do three things. Gives me a what, gives me a so what, and gives me a so what of the so what. That's what we're trained to do as intelligence analysts. Everything that I've seen for every AI data or, or piece of app, AI application that I've seen is pretty good, is very good at, at understanding a what. You spit out a country in, in, you know, in Central Asia, Azerbaijan, right? But you didn't really give me a so what. Right, you sorta of did, and you definitely didn't give me the so what of the so what. Um, you didn't do it with Finland when that that question when that question came up. 
it just sort of gisted what other people thought about it. So how do we sit down with, say, intelligence analysts to come up with those, those types of skills, um, different ways of looking at problems, and frankly, asking questions? Because, because I've, I've not seen it, as promising as AI should be in this realm, I've just not seen it deliver. And I'd, I'd love to see it deliver. That's Thanks. A, sir, that's a great question. And in, in one hand, we look at the environment that we're in today. So in some hands, right, we're not being political today. We're, so some of the things that we're doing today is we're not showing you everything that's under the hood. What you're talking about is critically important, and that's the kind of thing that I would say, like afterwards, we, we could sit down with lunch and, and you and I can go at it with the machine. And then if it can't do some of the things you're talking about, you're the kind of person I'd say, is there a way I could grab five or 10 hours with you and we just kind of go through this exactly how you want to see it? Because if I can get you to sign off as like that, is what I want to see. I feel more confident going in front of my superiors and saying, sir, I have a sign off from you, sir. And he, so that's, that's where we are. So what it can't do is what we go and find a solution to. So with that question you just asked is essentially important. We're always failing forward, right? We're falling down, getting mud in our eyes. We get back, brush it off. So what you just said, can we do some of that? Yes, would I say that we're rocking that one? No, right? So you made us an excellent observation. But we can get there with the help of people like yourself sitting down with us to help do that. And, and frankly, we've done that, right? We've yes, sir. That. I mean, I'm, I'm born in town, right? Like the intelligence community has been done that. <coughs> continues to do it, right? It's, it's legal, it's useful. Um, but but it's, it's really hard to, it's really hard to, to move beyond the paradigm now, to move beyond the data, yeah. right? And um, to, to actually come up with a really hard, I mean, that's, that's you know, we, we talk about command. Yes, sir. For an intelligence analyst, it's, it's a little bit of gut feel. It's a lot of yeah. train tracks. Right. It's, so it's a lot of, of right. understanding the problem of course that you see. Is that anything right. I say? Anyway, I, I take your point. I mean, that's, that's exactly what has to happen is, is, is you have to sit down with, you know, the, the, the true expert that comes from human intelligence and like. You just said, we have to sit down with the true experts and there not just go. say go to a machine. Right. And that's it. And we're, th and we're at the strategic level. And we're making sure that it stays at the strategic level where we are here. But excellent question, sir. It's always the last question. That's the best question. That's right. And I, I appreciate <laughs> Billy sir. talks a lot about getting patriots to come out and go forward and try to help. Uh, well, Billy's doing this sort of on a shoestring, and he's gotten all sorts of folks from entertainment industry and folks that are leaders in the field to donate their time and their talent to help him be successful on a shoestring. So uh, he's definitely got his heart into this. He's got skin in the game, too, with his daughter. but. Many thanks to Billy, and I think we're about out of time. If you want to continue the conversation, thank you so much for your time and your patience. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.